Hello and welcome back for a new episode of the Early Music Podcast, a series produced by REMA and dedicated to the future of the early music sector. My name is Yasmina Czernicic and this episode explores how the music collections of our libraries can be turned into a record, an edition, but also, and we chose to focus on this today, a stage performance. So it's a long way from a manuscript or an original edition that is kept preciously in the music department of a prestigious library to a finished concert or an album that you can enjoy without guessing that it took some hard work from the library department curators, maybe the digitalization team, but also the musicologists and researchers that studied it, and of course the performers themselves. And the journey begins with our first guest, who is the head of the music collection department of the Jagiellonian Library in Krakow. My name is Magorzata Krzos, and I work at the music collection section of the Biblioteka Jagiellonska called the English Jagiellonian Library. How are the music collections present in the library? The origin of the music collection department in our library dates back to the 15th century, although they didn't constitute a separate department of music. The 15th century collection included chiefly handwritten codexes. Music collections have been steadily enriched by manuscripts, liturgical books with the musical notations, as well as music prints, accumulated mostly from the early 16th century. Can you tell us about some items from the music collection, especially the ones that would interest early music lovers? In the collection of musical manuscripts are to be found the Middle Ages manuscripts or artifonders, pontificals and missals, which contain, in addition to written content, also musical notations. The major tendency is supplementing musical collection is the complexion of the 19th century work by Polish composers. Thus, in the music collection section, there are mostly autographs, among other, of the 19th century Polish composers, as well as of the contemporary ones. Besides, the music collection section holds at present a rich collection of autographs coming from the collection of the former Preußische Staatsbibliothek Berlin, among others, composition of Bach and his sons, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Cherubini, Mendelssohn, Bartoli, Meyerbeer, Busoni, Schubert, and also a multi-volume correspondence of Schumann, manuscripts from the 20th to 18th century, and old prints from 16th to 18th century. It contains circa 540 manuscripts, circa 400 autographs, and circa 2,600 music old prints. These materials were removed from Berlin by the Germans during the Second World War. This collection has a deposit character. It is available for research works for Polish and foreign scholars and editors as a basic source for the contemporary critical and facsimile editions of the best works of European music. Can you tell us about one item in particular that falls in our early music categories and that is relevant for researchers and performers today? Music collections contain many work worth it of study. Some of them are already partially arabolated, some not at all, and some would require redevelopment. Once a source is kept in our lab, at our library, the set of music manuscripts with the catalog number 5272. It is one of the most important sources for the history of Polish music culture at the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries. It comprises 55 church concertos, most of which being anonymous pieces. Among them is the earliest dated copy from 1692 of the composition of the one of the most eminent Polish composers of Baroque period. It is Stanisław Sylwester Szarzyński, and this composition is Ad Hymnos Ad Cantu. This composition has been included in excellently edited by Marcin Szeles, the works of Szarzyński, published in in the series Monumenta Musicae in Poland. How are the collections made available for the public, researchers for example, today? I told you about some projects already implemented to show the multidirectional range of and forms of cooperation. First one, this is exhibition. In, for example, 
in 2014, in our library with the Institute of Musicology of our university, together with the Friedrich Schiller University, Jena, and the Liszt School of Music, Weimar, organized an exhibition on Luigi Cherubini. The exhibition presented 30 autographs on Luigi Cherubini, masses, antiphons, so shorter sacred works, instrumental pieces and operas. Each manuscript has been described in detail in the 166-page catalog. cooperation is additions. For several years, the National Institute of Friedrich Chopin publishing a series of facsimile editions of Chopin autographs. Among them are also Chopin's autographs kept in our library. The third form digitalization of music collections. Our section has recently completed participation in a big project of digitalizing 4,000 of Polish printed music books kept in our library, which were published until 1947. The main call was taken by 19th century prints of known and forgotten Polish composers. We have recently performed an order for international Karl Lewe Gesellschaft, which is preparing the 8th Karl Lewe Festival on the subject, Karl Lewe and his choir music, in April 2021. In summary, music collections all the time are an additional base for domestic and foreign publishing houses. They are used scientific works, artistic events such as festivals, exhibitions. We successively publish on our website our collections and I hope it will please many researchers on the whole world. Many thanks, Magurjata Kshos, for sharing with us your point of view as a music collection curator and for telling us about the Jagiellonian Library's collection and its treasures for music lovers. Early music is all about going back to the roots of the music, looking for an original state and getting rid of centuries of tradition. So of course, having a look at a medieval manuscript, an autograph score or the first edition of a significant work sounds very exciting. But it takes more than just being able to read music to make the most out of one manuscript which is where philology and musicology appear, looking at the written sources with a critical eye, reading, comparing, correcting, and sometimes reconstructing. Our next guest is here to sum up how musicologists support early music performers and the challenges they face in this relationship. I'm Dinko Fabris, a professional musicologist with a strong interest in the performance of the music. This should be the primary interest of all my colleagues since musicology was born in 19th century to help performers to understand the forgotten notations and practices of the past and to enlarge their repertoire without uh, chronological barriers. But once entered in the academic system of universities for a long period Musicologists forget in part their vocation and the main object of the discipline, that is, the music itself. Nevertheless, there were in the last uh, 150 years or so many examples of uh, fruitful collaboration among musicologists and performers. The music repertories made available since the half of the last century, such as the rhythm, and the international catalogues of music uh, were all musicological projects uh, that have revealed to the performers a magic world virtually endless. This impressive heritage is not by chance managed by music librarians, in turn musicians trained in musicology. <laughs> Today, the situation is uh, much more favorable 
and in main conservatories uh, and schools of music we can appreciate patterns of collaboration among musicologists, librarians and early music students. But there are also negative cases where students never enter the library and they are satisfied to use uh, facsimile or photocopies of items that are owned in their own institutions, easily accessible. <laughs> Nobody can doubt the collaboration between musicologists and performers is mutually desired. Nevertheless, this collaboration is not at all easy and not without troubles. I can resume here in two points what I consider the big distances between a musicologist and a specialized performer when they start a source-based research together. The first point is the concept of discovery. This is a typical attitude of a performer entering a music library maybe the day after a night concert in a previous never visited city for a few hours and checking the catalogue, asking the librarian for unknown manuscripts uh, useful to be inserted in the next concert programme or in a CD in the way to obtain the label First Modern Performance or First Modern Recording. Less casuality but a similar scope is the today normal usage of the easy accessible catalogues online such as the RISM, the National uh, net systems such as Gallica or Internet Culturale and so on. For a musicologist, on the contrary, what matters is not a discovery, but the reconstruction of a context following an established methodology. <laughs> The concept of time is the second important big distance in between musicologists and performers. In general, a performer or a festival organizer or an agent is glad to ask the collaboration of a musicologist uh, in two cases. The very normal case is to ask at the very last minute uh, a musicologist uh, to be writing uh, a note for a concert program or for a comp already recorded CD, asking uh, just to put the name of this specialist uh, associated to, to this uh, enterprise. This could be, of course, very useful for the audience, uh, but this is uh, not, of course, a real collaboration. There is another case in which uh, the collaboration seems uh, starting uh, soon, that is uh, to invite a musicologist to provide a score, more or less critical for a production, a concert, or also a CD. And uh, in this case, what uh, is uh, clearly different is the conceiving the time necessary for providing a score. It is pretty normal for a musicologist to extend the researches in different libraries and countries, taking years to prepare a satisfactory score. The maximum time allowed by a performer is not years, weeks or maybe months. Impossible to be waiting more time also because there are many other projects in the waiting list of a musician for future concerts and future recordings. For this reason, is more and more in use that cultivate and expert performers are preparing their scores by themselves in a very fast way, transcribing and maybe already arranging from the original sources 
ten times faster than any musicologist. In many other situations, they decide to jump the transcription process, reading directly from the original sources, thanks to their great degree of expertise of notations. I can quote my friend Antonio Florio, that uh, is able to complete an, a complete transcription uh, of uh, a piece by a 17th century Neapolitan composer directly from the score, the original manuscripts, uh, where maybe are missing parts or uh, f- there are just fragments remaining, and he can reconstruct immediately the counterpoint or the missing parts uh, as it was the real composer. Not without reasons many eminent performers call themselves in program notes also musicologists. The choice to be fast sometimes cannot allow a musicologist to complete their research before the concert or the recording. Sometimes it occurred to me to discover only months or years after a piece was already recorded that just few words in the score were misunderstood and erroneously pronounced uh, or even the writing process of a piece could have changed, uh, uh, discovering a new source completely different from the one taken into consideration. There are cases in which the musicians can start from a philological reconstruction of a score, but adding new music or improvising according their experience or their mood, what they consider the best. I remember, for instance, when we were recording a Neapolitan Christmas cantata of uh, Caresana, a composer of the end of the 17th century, that the marvelous actor-singer Pino de Vittorio decided with Antonio Florio to add an improvised popular tune not existent in the manuscript of the cantata entitled La Tarantella. The result was simply beautiful. Years after, a BBC programmer asked me, as the musicologist involved in this recording, where I found this extra music not existent in the manuscript score indicated. And of course, I explained the origin of all this story. Musicians, Ave the mission to restitute the sound of the past through interpretation that is all times different and personal as an act of art. Musicologists, as part of the scientific community in one with the librarians, have the mission to follow a method that can allow any fellow scholar to reach the same results in any part of the globe. The two missions complement each other. I'm sure that the new field called artistic research can offer to both protagonists a new perspective of equal collaboration. Thank you, Dinko Fabris, for sharing with us the perks of being a musicologist. I can sense that the most pressing danger will always be time, the lack of time, and the competing agendas of research where a project can take years, and concert producing which may last a few months at most. So we have heard that musicologists may visit libraries for one of their research projects and have a direct access to the collections through their curators. And they're also contacted by performers, but sometimes performers can look at the written sources themselves and do without the musicologist. And this may even become the most common situation 
as digitalization of the collections makes many manuscripts available or seemingly available anywhere online. Let's go back to the Jagiellonian Library with one performer who spent some time there doing some research with a specific performance in mind. My name is Giulio Prandi. I'm a conductor and I am the artistic director of the Centro di Musica Antica, the early music center of Fondazione Ghislieri, Ghislieri Foundation in Pavia, Italy. And of course, I'm the conductor of Coro Orchestra Ghislieri, the resident ensemble, with which I'm very lucky to perform throughout Europe the repertoire I love most, which is Italian sacred vocal music from 18th century. This is a fantastic repertoire and very little is known of it. So throughout my entire career, a great part of my job was researching the repertoire, exploring the repertoire. And of course, now we can do that with digital archives. But at the beginning of my career, I got used to physically go to the archives, to the bibliotheques, and interact with the researchers and touch the scores, the manuscripts, the autographs with my hands. And this had a great influence on me that still I, I can feel today, even if now, of course, a lot can be done on the internet. <laughs> In February 2020, I was invited by Joanna Broniek, who is the programmer of the Misteria Pascalia Festival in Krakow, which is a fantastic festival devoted to passion time music. And this was very exciting because the whole idea was to explore the Jagiellonska Bibliothek for music by the Kapellmeisters in Krakow in the 18th century, which is, of course, my favorite period, and to explore also the Italian models for, for this music. And the idea is to dig into the archive and uh, produce a program to be presented into one of the next editions of the festival. Can you describe exactly the experience you had coming into the library? So I flew to Krakow and Joanna introduced me to the head of the music collection at the Jagiellonska Bibliothek, Malgorzata Kchos. And the collection of the library is, is just astonishing. I mean, I had occasion on the side of, of, this, uh, of this research to, to, to see some manuscripts from, uh, some manuscripts by Mozart or by Cherubini. And this was, of course, something very special for me. And this is also something that makes this experience very different from online research. Of course, you can find a lot of sources on the internet, but to go there, to see the places, to meet the people that devoted their life to these collections, and to be in contact with the composers through their own handwriting is something that has a very special influence on a musician. And this also today, for me, is not the same as dealing with PDFs or online resources. Is there one good find that you had while browsing the library's collections that would have been unlikely if you had been searching the online catalogue? As one of the goals of our research was looking into Italian style in Krakow in 18th century, uh, we also met Alexandra Patalas at the Institute of Musicology because she specialized in this kind of repertoire. And I have to say I was especially impressed by one composer, which is Gorczycki. His music is not unknown. There are CDs, especially by, by the 16. But I have to say that especially one work, uh, the Conductus Funebris, impressed me a lot. So I think this is, this is going to be one of the composers who we will be working on. More generally, what are the benefits of traveling to a library when it's possible? What kind of information can you find by looking at the sources directly instead of working with a modern edition when it exists? I think working directly on the sources is very, very important because there is a lot of information that you lose, of course, in modern editions. And I'm not saying that modern editions can only be bad. Especially when it is from the composer, when it is handwritten by the composer, manuscripts have only a lot of information that, that you can't find in a modern score. And, and it's not only about the scientific part of it. Of course, you can be very accurate in articulations, you can be very accurate in, in, in understanding what was the will of the composer. There are cases in which 
the experience of seeing it as it was written down in the first place is emotionally totally different. For instance, Baldassare Galuppi is a Venetian composer, uh, one of the greatest from 18th century, and he, he got Parkinson at the end of his life. So in his course, uh, well, this is very useful for datation because uh, you can see the disease getting worse and worse through years, and so you can use this as a datation tool, but also you can see Galuppi struggling for writing down his music, which is something very emotional. This is all very immaterial and very spiritual in a way, but it is important. And then, of course, I'm all for using very good, properly edited critical editions, because it's the way you can work best today. But I always find that sometimes you lose some information, also very detailed ones. I, I always think that if a forte is slightly right hand in, into the measure, it can mean something different. And in modern editions, sometimes we normalize the position of those scholars. But, but to, to see it as it was, the whole lot of information that you have sometimes, it gives you a different, slightly different picture that in my case always uh, drives me deeper into the music. How does this work in the library or online affect your performance? And, and how do you share this research with your ensemble and the audience? When I rehearse and perform a score, I always try to have the manuscript with me. And of course, this is of, well, of course, not the manuscript itself, because it would be illegal in most cases, but a copy of the manuscript. And this is of the greatest importance if it is a score that has been done for the first time in modern, in modern era. When I check something during the rehearsals, I always check it on the manuscript. And sometimes I show the manuscript to my musicians to explain why uh, I'm doing some, some choices and not other choices. So in a way, the, the direct contact with the manuscript is always with me, always during, through all the process. And the manuscript always ends up to be in the dressing room of the concerts with me. <laughs> I don't know if this is something that audience can feel because they don't see what I have on the stand and often I don't have anything on my stand because I normally conduct by heart. I don't know if the manuscript can be seen by the public in a way through my performance. I hope that my deep connection to the music can be seen. Thank you, Giulio Prandi, for describing what seems to be the best experience a performer could have of working with a library collection when it is possible to travel there and when the curators and researchers are available for discussion. Now, of course, today most libraries take the time to put their collections online, which has the double effect of making them more available for the world and of decreasing the conservation workload, as they are then less often physically manipulated. In the field of early music especially, having a direct online access to the manuscripts can be a blessing in disguise, with so many sources being available that you don't know where to begin, but with no direct support from the library itself to criticize what you are seeing. One performer who knows how to navigate this dangerous online ocean is Agnieszka Budzinska-Bennett, founder of the ensemble Peregrina. My name is Agnieszka Budzinska Bennett. I'm a Polish Swiss singer, musicologist, and early music scholar performer. For 20 years now, I run my ensemble Peregrina, and we've been very lucky to present very many various programs of early medieval stuff up to 14th century basically and perform all over the world. My whole life, I've been combining uh, my artistic pursuit as a singer and I play a bit of a harp as well and researcher so this is a combination of my two strengths hopefully and uh, it's something that works very well together. My focus is mostly vocal music uh, between the 9th and 14th centuries and it just uh, it's very very rich in ideas in aesthetics ideas texts music so um, this is already an abundance of uh, material that I'm dealing with so um, it's yeah extremely rich period of time with lots of different different styles of music how do you access the sources what are the options for you as a researcher and performer? I've been 
lucky to have been working on on this repertory already for over 20 years and um, obviously I could notice um, a huge difference in our researchers attitude towards the sources facsimiles manuscripts and editions we've been all very lucky in recent decade last decade 15 last 15 years with the digitalization which mean which means that we dealing with um, so many manuscripts that are in the libraries or monasteries uh, all over the world we don't have to travel there i mean if we can we willingly do but everything got much more accessible so now we have a really fantastic resolution resources we can work on while we're at home. I remember working on a microfilms already. I've been working in a microfilm archive in Basel, which meant working on a, on a, on a physical material that must seem uh, slightly ridiculous to people nowadays. Uh, many of these copies were already uh, damaged or, or, or broken, uh, certainly black and white. And uh, for example, if you have something you call Rollfilm, which is a huge manuscript on a on a, yeah on a roll, <laughs> you you have to go through the whole manuscript to find a folio, so a page you need for, you need to um, for your project you, you you're looking for. It, it it was just really so difficult to find that very spot on the microphone. And nowadays, of course, I I make one click and I have this piece in front of me, in a beautiful high resolution color copy. So I can work obviously better and faster. And especially because in early medieval uh, repertories we work with very many various sources. So what musicologists from the beginning of 12, 20th century or, yeah, or, or mid 20th century had to do with traveling to all these places and waiting for um, an access to a manuscript and work on the manuscript itself, this is quite foreign to us. Um, it's a pity on one hand because, of course, it's like um, something very sacred to have an ex physical access to the manuscript that it's, it's holy to you or it's very important for one um, repertory. But we still can do it, but we're not uh, dependent on that. And it facilitates our work enormously. So basically, I work with PDFs or, or, or pictures from the manuscript with good resolution. And as far as the editions are concerned, of course, I always consult them mostly in the end, um, after I have done my own transcription. Let's talk about how you tackle the research and study that supports one of your ongoing projects, Mare Balticum, with two albums released and two in preparation, which focuses on the medieval repertoires of the Baltic area. Mare Balticum is a project that actually exactly connects anything that is available in a very marginal part of medieval Europe, so to say. I mean, no offense, it's just uh, the region that was Christianized uh, relatively late, which means that also the monasteries and places where scribe could work on a manuscript were rare. So um, it's all fairly late and quite scarce. But at the same time, the whole region of the Baltic Sea shows many connections, many concordances in, uh, in the repertory. And it's really interesting to see the witnesses of really late practice, like for example 15th and 16th century liturgical chant in Finland that seems like 13th century, and yet it brings a new quality because, for example, it is in Old Finnish. So we have Gregorian chant in Old Finnish, which, which is a complete, uh, it's a crazy combination and something really interesting for a performer because the chant that we know from 9th, 10th, 11th century, all of a sudden lives different life because a different language was set to that. So um, that's, that's highly interesting. And we can gain lots of information from retrospective repertories because um, 15th, 16th century, we're already somewhere else, as some of these sources tell us, I mean, in, in, the, in the mainstream of Europe. The sources are scarce, but um, 
mostly well written because of course we have already means of writing precise page and um, there are already printed sources in that time so it's a it's a very courageous mixture of very old and and very new so like in one of these sources in Finnish Pie Canciones, we have traces of pieces that go back to 12th century and the sources from 16th century. Four centuries in one source, that's quite exciting for any, any researcher and any performer. As an example of choices that you have to make, can you tell us more about how much interpretation is needed when dealing with medieval sources? When we talk about working with facsimiles or transcriptions, this is um, something known to um, all early music performance and yet uh, very important differences because um, for example if we take the quite important caesura of between the 13th and 14th century only from 14th century basically we can kind of trust the transcriptions because the transcriptions from that music onwards basically depict or show us what stay in the manuscript but translated in modern notation and this is more or less this is all very general but more or less reliable if we take music from centuries before that we encounter major and and really huge problems we are dealing with um so many unknown factors of one single piece. We are not certain we read the pitch correctly because there are some, some pieces in which the pitch is indicated better, but there might be a place where we start wondering, is it an F or is it a G? Do I read here an interval of a second or interval of a third? And this is a really huge difference. On our decision, let's say I decided to read this interval or this, this neum as a third, on that decision depend the rest of the piece. So we can completely change the melodic landscape of one piece. And this is very individual and this is uh, all prone to discussion. But also another thing, the rhythm, for example, in 13th century we are able to write at least some, partly, the rhythm uh, where we can show exact proportions for some parts of the piece, but not for, not for everything. But basically, this is our decision. Is this piece uh, to be read rhythmically? Um, what are premises to impose any rhythm? Is it measurable? How do I use the measurability? Um, if we deal with a polyphonic piece, we have a problem of the voice alignment, which is never clear. So, to make a long story short, we land by a complete sometimes complete different transcriptions of one and the same piece. Sometimes we do not recognize even that that's the same piece because there are so many options, so many things are open. this is actually my duty to prepare my own transcription and uh, it may differ completely from anything that's edited if there are official editions or if it's a transcription in an article or something even unpublished but this is so important because we we dealing here with huge differences that maybe later early music doesn't know to that extent but f for early medieval stuff. Uh, this is very crucial to make your own decisions based on analysis, based on your knowledge, based on anything that's there. We just have a plurality of choices, a diversity of solutions and different ideas of proximity to the source. And this is our task to try to deliver ourselves and then also to discuss in symposium in also with colleagues that perform the same piece. We have so much freedom, we have so much artistic freedom based on a very severe and very precise philological analysis. There's still so much and still so much space. So it's quite, quite important still to get as, as close to the source as we can. And one limit is also that you have to put an end to the research at some point and focus on the performance. 
we can spend exactly years on, on just like analyzing one piece depending on the degree of, of, of complexity of these problems that I mentioned just like pitch and rhythm this is enough for, for weeks and we have to so to say produce programs and this all happens even before we start rehearsing so it's it's kind of an absurd uh, way of working <laughs> in terms of practicality but that's what we're supposed to do and that's what we love doing Besides your music, how do you pass on your knowledge to the audience or the listeners of a city or maybe to your students? Of course, I appreciate any public that comes out of curiosity to listen to that music. But um, of course, the more you know, the more you can appreciate it. And this is the same as valid for us. The more I know about the piece I'm going to perform, the more, the better probably I'm going to perform it or, or, or understand it or analyze it. So this is the, the processes of understanding uh, as for any music, but especially the further we go in the music history, the, most, the, the more difficult it becomes because these are foreign, foreign times. My favorite moment in teaching is to, to, to find, of course, you need to know the repertory very well, but to find a piece that um, students can uh, sight read. And it's a great satisfaction when they can do it, and I can tell them, look, this is now the piece that is a thousand years old, and now you did well. It's possible to have some access, and I, I do take care that um, my listeners do have it. There is a podcast I'm preparing exactly about. I chose one uh, one piece as an example because it's exactly uh, the sea of problems opens already. The Pandora's box opens. So it's 12th century piece which has um, nine existing transcriptions. Some are published and five renditions, recordings of this piece. These nine transcriptions differ. Uh, you, you couldn't imagine a more vast pool of differences. And in addition to that, we have these five recordings that do not acknowledge any of these transcriptions in a booklet. Uh, they, they say, or at least it's implicit, that they worked themselves on the manuscript and prepared their own transcription, which is again five other renditions or ideas of what this piece is and how it was done. So um, I think that's quite exciting to see something written that differs and to hear something that differs completely, including, so to say, the tonality or modality of the piece. So this one single piece has awoken so much interest and yet so much disagreement. So it's quite exciting to show the, the big, big uh, span of possibilities. We can, we can make a scale Exactly, the proximity to the source, uh, what was respected, what was disrespected, what was misunderstood, what was understood differently. So this is a very, very uh, interesting thing. And especially if we include the recordings, which are another way of transcribing a piece because it's a living uh, transcription in a living sound. It's once done, it's there. So this is your decision you've made, uh, similar to the, to the decision the editor made. So it lives this life afterwards. Lucky us in the performance, in the concerts, I can do the same piece differently and see which version, so to say, I like better, which version seems to be more probable. We can evaluate and we, we have to evaluate the work of the others, I mean also of our colleagues. Um, we have to be critical about uh, exactly transcription or recording because this is quite important. We cannot rely on that. The interpretations are sometimes very far going or far in the sense of really distance, no? I mean um, going away from the source, trying to be as close as possible without embellishing it with anything, without adding stuff. To put it in a nutshell, what do you think that working with many sources and comparing them is teaching us? It is teaching my students to be critical and, and showing them ways in which they... Some borders, basically, borders are good. I mean, we, 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 we don't have absolute freedom. And it's good like this because there was no freedom in the way the piece was written. I mean, it had its rules and we have to respect these rules and we have to 
try to perform this piece that always there was an intention of the composer of the scribe that it somehow sounds within our performance that we respect the structure that we respect the language of the piece verbatim and the language and the musical language I think we owe early music and any music and any uh, literary work, we owe the respect to the idea of the composer, of the writer, and, um, and we owe them our humbleness. What else should we be doing if not respecting what was there and how it was understood? This is just most exciting to understand how human beings were working in previous centuries and humbleness in front of the source will remain my motto, and that's what I try to transmit to my students. Thank you, Agnieszka Budzinska, for this presentation of your work as a performer, musicologist, and teacher that puts the way we approach written sources into perspective. Once again, the issues that the specialists of medieval music face embody perfectly the challenges of historically informed performance of more recent music. Dealing with unreliable sources teaches us to stay critical but at the same time, what performance or recording in mind teaches us about the choices which have to be made. And thank you for listening to this episode of Our Future Past. This podcast series is a preparation for the upcoming European Early Music Summit that will take place in Bozar in November 2020 in partnership with the AEC. It will assess the state of early music today and take a critical look at its practices and evolution. Each episode of our podcast is dedicated to one topic that will be debated during this three-day conference. So stay tuned for more.